Ladies and gentlemen, all men strive for gold in their life, right? Gold medals, gold watches, gold everything. However, there is a certain type of man who goes the extra mile. He walks with the confidence of an eagle and giggles in the face of danger. He's a big, hairless, winning machine when he unzips his pants and sees platinum. That's right. Manscaped would like to announce that their biggest and best hygiene bundle, the Platinum Package 4.0, is now available down under. Is also it, in Australia. This is a weird script. Manscaped is the leader in below the waist grooming and now trust them with the whole shebang. Join the 6 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com and using the code TRUEFOOTY20 at checkout and you get 20% off and free shipping. Enjoy the podcast. Hello and welcome to True Footy Podcast. I want to say 91, but I can't say that with any confidence. I was just going to say 90 something. 90 something, we'll go with that. Uh, joined once again by my illustrious co host, Daniel Busher. Long Bush, time no see. What is popping? Nothing too crazy. I wish I had a nice little European holiday like yourself, yeah. but. True. Holding it down here. Yep, yep. Um, I have been away for maybe our audio listeners who either didn't know or forgot that I've been in Europe. If you watch the YouTube channel, I've mentioned it a few times. <laughs> Uh, so looking a little bit more tanned, um, when I got to Spain, they were saying hello at first, and then by the time I left, they were saying hola. So uh, I started to uh, look a bit like a local there after a few days. But good That's trip. one of the many nationalities people have said to you over the years that you look like. You've, you cop a few. I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably the most exotic one was Cypriot. Like, not even Greek, just <laughs> Cypriot. <laughs> yeah, right, fair enough. Yeah. Oddly specific, I like it. Yeah, yeah. But um, for those wondering, I am pretty boring old Australian English, Scottish, yep. Irish, but nobody really asked for that. But uh, we're on a tangent here, so uh, it's good to be back, Bush. It Lighthead. has been uh, like a good six weeks since we've done this podcast together. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it's good to be back uh, almost where it all began, and yep. uh, we're into the thick of finals. So I was just hoping my team would still be around to be gloating and victorious, but um, alas, last night happened. I'm not going to lie to you, I was thrilled that you didn't win. <laughs> and I don't, Of that, course you were, you were on this Collingwood bench. Yeah, true. I was a medical sub. <laughs> Unfortunately, didn't get uh, onto the field, but that's all right. I got fresh legs for the prelim now. Um, but yes, I, I'm not going to lie. The I don't hate Fremantle, as you know, but I just something about the flag mantle social media <laughs> campaign. It just I was just ready to see it end. Uh, so. But uh, we will get into that, um, as well as all the other finals action. Playing a bit of catch up, obviously. I missed a lot of football. I remember I was in Berlin. And I stayed home one morning instead of going out and living my life. I stayed home to watch Josh Kennedy's last game. So that was the only game I watched while I was away. That's understandable. He's a great man. Yeah, great game too. We lost, uh, but it was, gee, it was exciting. Um, <laughs> highlight of the trip, actually. Um, Kick like eight goals or some shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, was, that, was, yeah. that was the highlight of the season, actually, yeah. for the Eagles. But. I was quite happy he didn't play the derby the following week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Me too, to be honest. It wouldn't have <laughs> gone down too well for us, I don't think, but... Uh, regardless, let's talk about some finals and teams that are actually relevant, Busher. Yep. So, uh, I thought the format uh, would be a, a good one to go through some of the teams that have been eliminated. Uh, so, we've had two teams eliminated this week, but we'll also we'll touch on the seasons of Richmond and the Western Bulldogs, who were the first teams eliminated last week. So, uh, we'll start off with the first semi final. Chronological yep. order uh, Melbourne going down to Brisbane. Straight set. Shock you? I uh, did a little, but. The more I think about it, the less it should have. Like mm. the whole back half of the year, Melbourne have just been not that good. They've blown mm. a lot of leads yeah. as well. It's been a recurring theme. So even when they have been ahead early, they've shat the bed a few times. Yeah, they've been on their knees blowing leads left, right, and centre. But um, <laughs> we're back. Um, yeah, I must admit I'm a little bit surprised. Like you say, it's one of those things that now with the benefit of hindsight, you're like, okay, that was trending that way, but. For me, I, I had faith that Melbourne would sort of recapture their yeah. form because last year it went. There was similar parallels last year. They dropped off. There was talk about the mid forward connection, and ultimately come up short in the semi final in very disappointing fashion. You know, Any time you go out straight sets when you're the reigning premiers is uh, that's pretty devastating yeah. fashion for their supporters. But especially finishing the year six and eight the way they did after the ten and zero. Mm, that's right. Yeah, I think you guys were the first team to knock them off uh, middle yep. of the year, and um, yeah, since then they've been patchy and. I think I made the comment in my video early this week, like contrasted last year, they're losing to all the, or we're losing to all the other contenders this year. Whereas last year they were beating the contenders and losing to the bottom teams. Showed strangely. up when it mattered. Type Showed of up thing. When, exactly. Um, so, and, and I think the added sort of layer to it as well, the disappointing aspect is uh, Brisbane are a team who struggle to A, win finals and B, win at the MCG <laughs> and have lost to Melbourne heavily twice this year. So, 
Um, we're focusing on the yeah. negative here for Melbourne, and we will acknowledge the fact that it was a great Brisbane win. Have you yeah. been impressed with them this final series? Brisbane, yeah. Well, yeah, they're sort of that team that's always been just about that mark. Like yeah. they lost. Oh yeah, they ended up not. And they didn't end up in the top four, which was probably a little disappointing for them, but. Mm. They've still got themselves to the prelim. It's just taken a little bit of extra work. Yes. And it might even help them in the long term. A bit of extra confidence getting that win in Melbourne now mm. before a big before the big dance. Yeah, it's almost like they shot themselves a little bit in the foot because uh, this is the year they fail to make the four and have to put themselves in the position of winning three games in a row at the MCG. So they've, they've ticked the first box. But you do wonder if, like, you know, they finished fourth and had to play there only once or twice, then this could potentially have been their year. Whereas yeah, I currently think it's too much of a tall order for them to, to go all the way. Um, again, we're yeah. focusing a little bit on the negative when it was a great club yeah. win and um, through to a prelim is a great achievement. Um, I, I watched a bit of the game and, um, you know, there's some really impressive guys. Like Rich, he's still yeah. such a good player. Um, McCluggage as well. I yeah. think he's covering the ground better than I've seen him in that saying something for a guy yeah. with his endurance. Um Caden uh, Coleman, is it? Yeah. Uh, for, uh, for some Kitty Coleman's the nickname these sort of. Kitty Coleman, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they've he's quite a player in the back half as well. Yeah. He even um, goes forward a little bit. He's sort of a, mm. he's a good link up guy because his kicking's just so quality. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Although, yeah, sorry, we were focusing on Melbourne a little bit on purpose. But yep. what do you think the outlook is for them going into next season in terms of where they're at? Melbourne, they're still in a pretty good position. A lot of their heavy hitters are in that mid twenty sort of range where they're sort of in their primes, hitting their primes. Yeah. Gorney's probably going to need a bit of support if the assumed Jackson move happens, but which sounds it like... should, you yeah. think, right? You'd imagine it's going to happen based on all the smoke and whistles yeah. around it. Good win, smoke and whistles. Goodwin said <laughs> that um, Jackson would announce a decision in the next couple of days, which I think yeah. is the writing on the wall. If we didn't already yeah. know that, it, that's... Yeah. But they've been linked to get... Um, Grundy yeah. as a potential replacement, which would be very quite, good replacement. Yeah, very handy. Uh, but which one of those two is going to play forward feels like the issue. Even though Jackson hasn't been an outstanding forward this year yeah. for them ever, really. Yeah, you, it is weird that they're going to have to juggle two number one rucks. Like both yeah. of those guys, uh, the two number one rucks of the league in theory. Well, yeah, I mean, a few years ago, I think it's fair yeah. to say a few people have gone past Grundy now. Yeah. Um, Gorn's still up there. Um, you're probably looking at Darcy. Yeah. Um, I'll nominate Nick Nat because he's back to back All Australian as well before this year. So, um, yeah. but either way, like that is a you've got an elite midfield there who potentially are never going to have a weak moment in the ruck as well. Sure. You know, like when you focus on a team who's got a good number one ruck, you, that sometimes the ascendancy switches yeah. when the second ruck goes in there. That's not going to be the yeah. case for Melbourne, you'd think. Yeah, and um, I think Brody Grundy probably offers similar to Luke Jackson, like because that like extra midfielder type of ruck rather mm. than a pure tap machine like a Gorn is. I think True. Grundy still brings what Jackson's brought to them. True. Different skill set, yep. isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, long story short, I think the list demographic's still right in the middle of their prime. Uh, they've been drafting as well, like uh, taking first rounders each year. I yep. uh, don't think they have one this year, but they'll get one through Jackson. Um, yeah, they're in a good spot, yep. I'd say. It's just a disappointing outcome when you're the premiership favourite for most of the year and then go out in straight sets. But Definitely. It does happen quite often. Uh, let's talk about the second semi-final, uh, Collingwood. Uh, you were saying before yeah. in your own words that you thought the scoreline flattered Fremantle a little bit. Collingwood getting it done fairly easy. Would you agree with yeah. that assessment? And I think if Collingwood kicked more accurately, it would look a lot worse for Fremantle. Like their inaccurate kicking was the one reason I sort of sat through most of that game, game going, yeah, we can come back if we mm. pull our fingers out. But I mean, to Fremantle's credit, they have a proven yeah. history of coming back. Yep. Don't they? So that was justified. And even I was thinking it as well. Yeah, Collingwood went from like six goals one to like seven goals 12 or something. Yeah. I think they had nine behinds in a row. Hoskin Elliott and Ash Johnson both kicked a couple of goals three. atrocious ones. Yeah. yeah. A couple Hos- of real easy ones that they missed. Yeah, Hoskin like, Elliott psh- at the end there. Um, I did notice that as well. But we'll talk about Fremantle specifically. Great season, yep. you'd have to say. Like now that the disappointment of last night has worn off, you'd have to reflect on it as a big, big positive. Like if you told a Fremantle fan at the start of the year that we were going to win a game in the finals, mm. they'd take that to the bank. Like yeah. after the past six years, they'd go, "Yep, that's the positive direction we've had." Mm-hmm. And I think it was good the way it sort of happened in a way for like our future prospects. Like they got a win in a final, so they sort of mm. got to experience that, get the confidence off that. Mm. But then they had to play a hard ninety thousand crowd at the MCG against them final yep. where they lost and they can learn from that adversity it was really obvious in fact it's both teams but i think collingwood handled a little bit earlier better earlier 
uh, how frenetic the game yeah. was. Like I thought these guys, these both of these teams are going to mm-hmm. tire out because there was no composure at all. Yeah. Understandably, because you have the ninety thousand strong crowd roaring like that and I, none of those boys would have had that atmosphere before at least not a crowd going against them uh, well a few of the Collingwood boys would have that's, oh sorry that's what, yeah. yeah whereas like yeah Collingwood's a young team as well but they still have a few of those guys mm. around in 18 a few of those guys who have played some serious campaigns like your Pendles your mm. Sidebottoms they, they get to play uh, Carlton at the G and, and yep. uh, Anzac Day like those guys oh, who would have had that crowd before I've got a statistic that was interesting I saw last night since the 2013 grand final Fremantle have played at the MCG 15 times. This season, Collingwood have played there 16 times. <laughs> That's just a little tidbit I that found interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is a low point in Fremantle's history that lasts since that 2015 grand yeah. final, so understandably, but um, that is that is still interesting. Mm. That is still interesting. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Fremantle finished 11th last year, annihilated by the Saints in the final round last year to, to see where they're at now. And, and I would make the assessment that they were closer to fourth than they were eighth. You know what I mean? If yep, you look at the definitely. talent gap, the top six, I think there was a bit of a gap to Richmond and, and the Bulldogs. Oh, standard Carlton screwing us over like every bloody yeah, circumstance yeah. they can. They ultimately screwed themselves over. They did screw themselves as well, to be fair. But yeah. yeah. Also, another sort of comparison I'd sort of say for Freo, as I've said it a couple of times, is we're kind of like Sydney, but a year behind where they're at. Mm. Like, because you saw this sort of form from Sydney last year that Fremantle exhibited this year. Mm. Similar, like, young profiles of their list. Yeah. I think it's reasonable comparison to say we're sort of on that trajectory, but just a year behind where they're at because they've had that extra year of getting their talent through the door and development and all that. Yeah, yeah. Very, very strong young list. Like, very young yeah. Fremantle. Um, we'll, we'll talk... I wanted to get your thoughts on, like, the outlook for next season for Fremantle and weave in some trade talk, and I think this is all related. So, uh, we talked about Luke Jackson at length on this show. Um, so, we accept... We know your thoughts about potentially getting him, but we have also referenced... The potential, um, what's the word? Loss. Fallout, I guess. Yeah, and yeah. loss. If if Fremantle lose a player or players as a result of, of requiring Jackson. So there, there's about five players l- yeah. uh, linked to moves away from Fremantle. You can make the argument they're not too related to the Jackson thing. I don't know. Maybe mm. money is a factor for some of them. But uh, we'll name uh, Darcy Tucker, Griffin Logue to pot- potentially North Melbourne, Akers to Carlton, Meek to GWS, and uh, there is somebody else that I am forgetting. Liam Henry? Is that, uh, that was not... Oh, Lob. Lob yeah, Lob's the main yeah. one. Yeah. But I saw, Henry linked? I saw a rumour this morning, but the thing is with the Liam Henry specifically, his manager is Colin Young, mm. who's notorious for leaking stuff to the media to try and help right. his guys have a leg up in negotiations and stuff. Yeah. So I think they'll hoping that we'd offer Liam Henry a better extension than what we probably have offered. Yeah. So I think that's a Colin Young tactic. Even the Griffin Logue stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm worried about Logue, but at the same time, it still feels like it could get done because of the stuff in the media being a combination of Colin Young and just mm. people running with it type of thing. Yeah. But yeah. I do... Th- I am worried about Logue by now. I yeah. thought that would have been dealt with. What about... I mean, I just... I think... I'd be concerned about losing like five players at once, you know. So Certainly. Lob's probably out the door, and that's probably regardless yep. of Jackson. We knew that. Um, we can. You could maybe make the argument that Acres and Logue, that could be money related. Yep. Uh, and that indirectly is probably linked to Jackson or directly linked yeah. to Jackson. So, are you concerned about potentially losing those players, or are yep, you certainly. relaxed? Okay. Even like Acres, even though I think we've got enough sort of guys who can take that place on the wing. He, I would argue, he was our best player last night. Especially in that yeah, first he half, good. he was so many hardball gets. He was all over the field, mm. and apparently, like you li- like listening to like Logue's podcast and stuff. Like he's the finds master of the club, so it seems he's become a part of the culture and everything. Mm. Logue's mm. another True. guy that drives a lot of that. Yeah, a lot of these you don't want to lose too many of those sort of characters, mm. even for like a big fish. Yeah, hundred percent. And then you also factor in Monday retiring as well. Yep. So yeah, I, I'd say that's a little bit of a vulnerability here for Fremantle is losing like a middle tier out of their list a little bit. Um, obviously, Meek yeah. going is not a big deal like if Meek, Jackson. The thing is with Meek, I wouldn't begrudge him at all because yeah. the thing is he's too good to be playing waffle, Yeah, but he's not going to get past Sean Darcy mm-hmm. unless he, Sean Darcy cops an injury, Yeah, especially if we bring in Luke Jackson as well. Yeah, There's no way Meek's getting a game over those two. Yeah, no, you agree. So I can understand Meek going to GWS where he walks in the number one Ruckman, I'd say. There's yeah. probably several other teams where he could walk in as their number one Ruckman. Yeah, yeah. I think even my club is linked to having interest in him. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Dogs and Tigers, uh, just yep. generally um, about their seasons. The Tigers were the first team eliminated. After 2021, 
they uh, they were all over the place. Um, mm. Sort of similar to West Coast, I remember it. And I'm making the connection, but um, it's funny how <laughs> since then both teams, uh, one recovered and one died in the ass. Um, did you see a Richmond resurgence coming this year? Because you'd have to give them some credit for jumping back into the finals after a poor year last year. Yeah, I sort of, even through like the early season podcasts, I, I was probably someone who was, people thought I was overrating Richmond, but I sort of mm. felt like they still had what they produced in them. Mm. I didn't think they'd get through to major deep finals, but I still thought they were a team that could finish right where they sort of finished on the ladder. How happy do you think they can be factoring in... Um, it's a mature list and every season counts, but equally good comeback season in theory. Yeah, but sort of given them something to build on if they have a good trade and draft period, which mm. we're going to get into. They've got a couple of guys that I think will help them, Yeah, to yeah. say the least. Big time. I made a video on this yesterday, yeah. actually. I think I think overall they'll, they'll rue their inconsistency this year. At times looking like top four team at their very yeah. best. And also there's some losses to the Suns at the death there. They lost to North at the death yeah. and the Crows beat them as well. Yeah. So three winnable games there, which was the difference yeah. between them being fourth or fifth. Yeah, I think a little bit as well, like something I've just sort of noticed watching the last couple of years, Damien Hardwick is the biggest winger I've ever seen yeah. as an AFL head coach. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. He just whinges about everything. Mm. And you kind of see that sort of attitude spread for the team a bit. Like, yeah. And I don't think that creates the kind of consistency that they had a few years back where they were sort of the hunter rather than the hunted. Yeah. Because being the hunted sort of seem they seem to have a bit of whinging in title <laughs> and this type of... I, I do notice yeah. and agree that Hardwick selectively just like chooses points to be passionate about and whinge about when mm. it's directly impacted his team. Yeah. Like, and most of it's hypocritical. Like Yeah, this. like the tagging... Th- oh, this yeah. is going back a number of years, but he had went on a massive tangent about how they should leave Dusty alone and not tag him so hard. It's like, uh, mate, <laughs> come on. Uh, Tagging's been part of the game for, I don't know, since the 90s. Yeah, since before know. strategy was a part of the game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably It's probably been older than that, yeah. Um, yeah, and I was going to mention the inconsistent performances, only beating us by 109 points. So yeah. <laughs> that's uh, they've left a bit on the table there. Um, but they had some wins. Like uh, Lynch was second in the Coleman, and he's yeah. delivering on that that trade a few years ago. Bolton kicked 43 this year. Bolton's good. He's man. a gun player, but 43 is a very good output for, yeah. output for a guy who also can play in the midfield and play high. So uh, Rewalt 40, good good output yep. for you know a veteran. Uh, how good can they be next year, assuming that they get Taranto and Hopper, um, who have both been linked and requested trades, I believe. Yeah. And uh, Dusty's re-signed as well, yeah. as well as Cochin, who's probably not yeah. quite on the same level. But uh, w- how good do you think Richmond can be next year? Top three, top four mm. with those two guys, because that's just sort of, they need a bit of that heavy lifting in the midfield a bit more. And both of those guys offer that in spades. Presti had a great year. Yeah, but Presti's good, that, but he needs support. Mm, yeah. Like, and those two offer that in Prem, like, you can do, like, a Taranto, Dusty, like, one in the midfield, one mm. of that half-forward sort of rotation mm. type of thing, because they're both sort of those bullish players that can impact in both positions. Yeah, it's clearly signalled intent to just keep going, yeah. isn't it? Um, and you, when you're a big Victorian club with some pulling power, that, that yeah. makes sense. So, yeah, that's a luxury that you have. Yeah. And it's interesting, because I think it's actually plausible trade-wise, because both of those guys are very good players, but... Because mm. I know they have 12 and 19 this year, Richmond. Yeah. So those two and a future first probably gets it done. Yeah, I think I suggested 12, 19, a future first and 30, assuming yeah. that's like too late first for both players or a first and a second for both players. Yeah. Um, I think Taranto is out of contract maybe. Um, oh, yeah, possibly. But, but Hopper, I think, is a pre-agent. Or, yeah. or I think they're both not. pre-agents, actually. Could be wrong. Yeah, I'm not too yeah. sure. That's kind of key. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, regardless... Probably probably yeah. gets done. Yeah. So the flag window is well and truly open. But yeah, yeah when you consider like that team, and they took a lot of picks last year, so they sort of still got some mm. youth to work with as well as sacrificing their draft hand this and next year. Likely, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, they they invested heavily, and I wonder if they had a mind to do that, knowing that they were going to come hard for some players this year. Uh-huh. Um, it's good, good list strategy, I would say. Yeah, they've been one of the best at that for sure over but the even last like, six, seven years. They've even been like a stable team in their starting midfield has been like Prestia, who's a great player, and then yeah. Cochran, who's probably well past it, and yeah. then Marlon Pickett, Liam Baker. Yeah. <laughs> like That's no disrespect to those players individually. It's just that's not yeah. a formidable mix. So when you get in a team that's already good and add Taranto and Hopper, it adds a lot of depth. And obviously Dusty is on and yeah. off the field at the moment. So 
Uh, we'll talk about the dogs. Uh, very disappointing in the scheme of mm. things when you are runners up the previous year, this year. Uh, last year they looked worthy of a premiership and this yep. year they never really hit that pace. Uh, they snuck into eighth spot and uh, I think a 41-point turnaround loss in, a first, in the first final is just the sums up their season, basically. Uh-huh. They're linked to Lobb as a forward ruck, um, which would be an interesting acquisition for them involving your club. With that in mind, how, how do you think they shape up for next year? Where do you think their list is at? They're too hard to pick them at this point because, like, Ever since they've won the flag in 16, they've just been up, down, up, mm. down. They're just so inconsistent. No top four finishes in that time. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and they've sort of had the youth and, like, talented list to sort of mm. be in that position, and they've never actually been there. Mm. I would... Other I would than s- a couple of hot runs from the bottom half of the eight. Yeah, yeah. You've had some hot runs in your time. <laughs> um I would suggest that I think their list is still in pretty good shape uh, yeah. in terms of demographic. When you know so many of their best players are still in their prime, they are linked to losing Josh Dunkley, yep. uh, which is a possibility and will be a blow, albeit for a team that is um, already strong in the midfield. But I think if they get lobbed, then they that's another attacking option. But I think down back is really where they need mm. to sort their shit out a they little bit. Going to have, especially if they keep playing Sam Darcy and Norton both as forwards, like. Mm. And they'll lob into the mix. Yeah. Like, yeah. And then English plays. Yeah, Hugo Hagen. I think it's worth sending one of those two back, Norton or Sam Darcy. Yeah. Norton's a very good back, but he's sort of more established as a forward, whereas mm. Sam Darcy's sort of a bit more moldable into what you want him to be at the moment. Yeah, that's true. Norton's a, it's a bit Rob Peter to pay Paul, unfortunately. Mm. Like, you give up so much by taking him out of the forward line, but potentially it could be the, the switch that yeah. changes their t- team dynamic completely. Yeah. So. Because Norton has the potential to be the best back in the league. Yeah. Yeah, he is very good. Yeah. They, speaking of best back in the league, they went hard at Tom Burris. Huh? Um, uh, but ultimately failed. So Yeah, that would have been a hard lure. Thank God. Because <laughs> you guys have the money to pay him, and plus he's a WA yeah. boy. Yeah, yeah. He signed for six years, I think, yeah. for us. So That was hot. Cool. So that is the, uh, the teams that have been eliminated. Um, we can talk a little bit um, about... I guess we can sort of segue into a little bit of trade talk before we talk about the yeah. prelim finals. Uh, we talked about uh, Hopper and Taranto, but we, uh, it's worth considering the inverse here. I talked about it in my video, but I'm really concerned, Wush, about GWS going forward in terms of they've been stable for this long period now, even though they've lost players, even after a horror 2020 uh, off-season. They've never really fallen off the perch. And this year, obviously, it was a bottom four finish. They were putrid at times. Now I'm worried about their ability to bounce back up the ladder if they lose to, uh, not only Taranto and Hopper, but Town of Brun, a first-round draft pick from a couple of years ago, is linked away. And uh, Riccardi as well to yep. Geelong, I think, is, is another rumour going around. So, so Bruin and Riccardi to Geelong? Uh, yeah. Because I've heard Bruin to Geelong. Bruin to North yeah. as well as possible. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly. He's from Geelong way as well. He is, oh, yeah. yeah. I think North have taken interest, so... Yeah, uh, what are your thoughts on GWS? Do you agree that this could be quite dire for them? I think it could be a Gold Coast Suns sort of scenario. If they play it right, I don't think it's too bad because they've still got some guys locked away for a long time. Mm. If they can kind of maximise their value for the leakage this year, they can kind of set themselves up to probably have a couple of shit years where they Mm. attack the draft hard. And then get back into it with guys like Kelly, Whitfield. Thing is, though, uh, Whitfield is 28. Um, Cornelio's 28. These guys, I suppose that's actually not as old as I was thinking. I, for some reason, mm-hmm. I thought they were about 30. Kelly's 26. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's not as dire as I think, but I'm, I'm concerned about their ability to, to retain these, mm-hmm. these draft picks. You know, It's like the same thing with the Gold Coast. Mm-hmm. Having five top 30 picks or, or like three first rounders isn't really the same value as it is for yeah. other clubs because of uh, notoriously losing players. So um, I, again, I've talked about it in my other video, but I think I think they will win the spoon next year. They're um, contenders. Yeah. And I will acknowledge that there was the, while they were terrible this year, they were a lot better than North and West Coast. Mm. I think North will strengthen based on... The Clarkson factor, they've been linked to like five established players, including a couple of Freo boys. And I'm, I'm interested to see how much that will immediately impact their ability to win games. Um, but I'm thinking I'm thinking GWS fall off a perch. That's yeah. my prediction. Well, it depends how they get as coach as well, because they yeah. haven't announced a new coach. Yeah, that's true. That's true. 
Um, speaking of the coach situation, we were talking before the podcast started about Essendon oh. um, and the Clarkson situation. So that, that all unfolded um, while yeah. I was away. But in my right in thinking, they essentially um, was it sort of leaked that they'd met with Clarkson, but they hadn't sacked Rat- Rutten. And then Clarkson mm-hmm. then later came out and said, oh, they were interested, but it was too late. Yeah. But they had still had Rut- Rutten in, in charge. Yeah. Basically, is that the shit? Pretty much, yeah. Like, they sort of, and they tried to enter the Clarkson race at the last minute as mm. well, sort of the way to put it, like, North Melbourne have been doing their due diligence for months. They've been having lots of meetings with him, sort yep. of coming up with a plan, that sort of thing, whereas Essendon showed up four days before he ended up signing with mm. North Melbourne, going, yep, you want to come, coach? Yeah. And he's basically like, yeah, you haven't given me enough time to consider this properly. Yeah. And then, but the, not only that, but the fact mm. that it went public before yeah. Rutten was actually sacked is yeah. a little bit heartbreaking for Rutten. Sure. And then they... they it was They've had a board implosion as well. Since yeah, all this. true. Because they announced that they had Rutten sacked or it was uh, it sort of hit the media. Yeah. Then they said no. And then I'm pretty sure it wasn't not long after that. Later, they were yeah. like, yeah, actually he's sacked. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, a bit of a PR shit show for us. And then half the boards resigned because they sort of had a split over the rut, keeping Rutten or getting rid of him. Right, yeah. Okay. And I think ultimately Kevin Sheedy jumped ship. So that was the tiebreaker vote, okay. something I've heard. Yeah, gotcha. But yeah, the, just the entitlement from Essendon. Just, mm. yeah, we're a big club. We can do this the easy way. Like John Warsfold, a couple of years ago, he came out with a very interesting, like when he left Essendon, he came out saying some very interesting stuff. Like what? Saying like, this is a club where you need to go through the processes of the mm. salary cap, drafting everything. You can't just be a good club because you're a big Melbourne club. Yeah, that's he true. He said that there's that entitlement ingrained yeah. deeply within the core of Essendon. And, I remember that now. And you see it with this Clarkson move. It sums mm. it up perfectly. Yeah. It's just... A little bit botched. Yeah, they need to get their egos in check, mm. but he... And I think, I think they pulled the trigger pretty quickly on Rutten, personally. Yeah, like, I think a bit premature myself. It was a horrible year, but... I'm the not... year before, he was arguably coach of the year. Yeah, exactly. So... Um, yeah, that, that's my thought. I thought worth another year. Sure, if Clarkson says yes, then maybe you make that transition, but he didn't. Mm. Uh, but because it was public, it was already, they ruined that relationship yeah. in front. So, yeah, maybe mm. maybe they just... And Ross Lyon won't even contemplate going for the job, apparently. He's... Well, he doesn't want to go for a job unless he's offered it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, apparently, they sort of met with him. And I, I, I think this was the same story at another club that I've forgotten. Carlton? My, yes, it yeah. was Carlton. That was only last year, yeah. wasn't it? Um, and he basically, reading between the lines, he sort of suggested that they weren't as keen as he wanted them mm. to be. Yeah, he didn't want to go through like the full application process. Yeah, yeah. which is... I uh, think he was like happy to do the PowerPoint or whatever, but all the other shit yeah, yeah. he wasn't into. Oh, well, fair enough. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah, that it does smack a little bit of arrogance, but, you know, it's yeah. up to him whether he wants to take on exactly. a job. You know what I mean? So that's uh, fair enough. Um, but yeah, Ross He's Lyon. proved himself. He's a bit of a knob, though. <laughs> <laughs> All of that. Oh, yeah, he is. All right, Bush, it's now, now time to talk about the prelims. We talked about yep. everything except the prelims. Um, and Best this is, last. Yeah, the, uh, well, the second biggest year, uh, week of the year, obviously, <laughs> and it's going to include the Brownlow as well, so we'll talk yep. a little bit about that. Geelong versus Brisbane. Uh, I'm probably getting the chron- chronological order of that wrong, but uh, we'll talk about that game first. Yep. Uh, Geelong obviously had the week off after fighting off a strong Hollywood side. That was a really good win. The fact that they beat Collingwood in a close game makes them pretty unique this year yep. because Collingwood have a knack for winning all those games. Um, and we talked a little bit about uh, the Lions having uh, a great a great comeback. And that, a comeback comebacks have been the the theme of this final series a little bit, haven't they? Like, oh, yeah. If, if you see a team get ascendancy, and we were thinking it last night, I'm sure, you get worried because you're like, ah, yeah. oh, this game's going to swing. It's been, it's been the tail of the final series so far. Brisbane haven't beaten Geelong, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was 2004. So I think John Howard was Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> memorable. Uh, Big Johnny. And I think that was a prelim as well, if I'm not mistaken. So if I'm thinking of the right year, Geelong hosted the Lions in a prelim, even though it was a Lions home game, because there was a contract that they had to play a certain amount of finals at the G. <laughs> so the, the Cats got to right. host the prelim, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. I'm thinking of the right game. Uh, and Brisbane obviously won that and lost to Port in the grand final. So I'm hoping my history on that is correct. But either way, it has been like 20 years since since they've beaten them outside of Queensland. But even that Geelong Collingwood game, just quickly, that was at the MCJ rather than at GMH Bay, or whatever. Mm. So that was a bit of an unfair thing for yeah, Geelong, I think. That's when they finished top of the ladder. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, and that that is an interesting point. They are obviously a pretty strong GMHBA side and the MCG is effectively more an away game than it is a home game for them. Um, it's not even really neutral yeah. against Collingwood. But in a sense, 
there's some benefit to it because they get some rehearsal on the MCG. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if they play the whole final series at the MCG, on grand final day, there's no surprises. Yeah. And That's against Brisbane, like. they still have an advantage, but the Collingwood game specifically, that felt a bit unfair for me. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And Collingwood, I don't think, have ever gone to GMHBA and probably never will. Well, I think they might have played at Skilled Stadium like 20 years ago, maybe, yeah. but back when it was Skilled. But you're right. It's, um, yeah, it is unfair. Yeah. Uh, Hopefully once the renovations are done, they, the AFL goes, yeah, there's a, enough mm. of a crowd there. We have to cop it. Yeah, well, wh- wherever Geelong want to play is where they should play. Yeah. Um, save for the grand final, obviously. Yeah. With Brisbane, obviously, we, the narrative around them is, and I've been banging on about it, is their inability to win at the G. Um, mm. And we just talked about their inability to beat Geelong away. Are you a little bit more confident in them based on two very good finals wins so far, one being at the MCG? Yeah, it sort of boosts their argument for mm. sure. Like Geelong's different sort of animal this year compared to the back half of the year, Melbourne and Richmond, mm. who True. are two of the least consistent contendery teams that we've had this year. Fair point. Whereas Geelong have been the standout team of the competition the whole year, mm. game or two clear, top of the ladder. Mm. Hawkins and Jez Cameron. Yeah. Don't know how Harris Andrews is going to go with both of them. Yeah, it will be a tough ask. They're one of the most stacked uh, sides in terms of foul, uh, firepower this year. Um, Tom Atkins has been a real find in that midfield yep. as well. I just want to shout him out. He's had a great season and been very key, I would say. Yeah, I mean... Tyson Br- Stengel, another guy that got oh, off yeah. the scrap heap who's borderline All-Australian. I'd say recruit of the year. Yeah. Off the top of my head, without really digging into... Him or else. Brody. Yeah. Him or Will Brody. Yeah, good call. Good call. Considering the value of how for what they required. Yeah, yeah. You actually made a profit on the Brody deal. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, when that was before you even played a game. In fact, if you take Brody out of the deal, you get a profit. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, the, yeah. So Geelong and Brisbane head to head. It's been a bit of a mixed bag. I think Brisbane, the last two times they've gone to GMHBA, have made a game of it. I think. Uh, yeah, they've been close. I recall they were close this year, and I think last year was the year. Um, I want to say it was Zach Bailey should have been given a hold on the ball free kick in the goal square, and they should have won. I think that was last year. So their ability to play Geelong on their own terms. Um, they should hold no fears. In fact, I think we we'll go back to two prelims ago. They hosted Geelong in the prelim um, and got annihilated at the Gabba. So it's a mixed bag of form there. Obviously, Geelong has the ascendancy in terms of that. This, for me, it's a little bit too much of a tall order for Brisbane. I think we're seeing a team that's playing with a lot of spirit and, and they've shown resilience. I think that's something they've developed this year. And I said, uh, and it's unfortunate it's coming a year where they finish six because, you know, mm. if they play like this but they have, you know, two... Um, a double chance then yeah. um, or even two home finals if they finish top two then they're a real but I think Geelong this particular weekend is too tall an order do you agree with that? yeah I'd agree How, what uh, likely do you think Brisbane? Have? I'd give Brizzy a 25-30% chance of winning the game yeah probably that, close to 25 healthy. yeah, yeah I'd, I'd agree with that because I, I I do have this vibe about them this GWS 2019 vibe about mm. them where they could just rattle no. A team They're a team <laughs> no that's reason. sort of been thereabouts for a few years, so mm. they've seen it all, done yeah, it all in finals sort of thing. Yeah, it's a young... Well, it's it's not a super young list. It's it, There's a lot of veterans in there, quality veterans, Neil and Zorko. And then there's a lot of young, talented guys who have played a lot of finals yeah. already. So J- Jared is Berry's going to be a big out. Yeah, he's is he out, one, is game, he? one game suspension. Oh, yeah. Because he raked Clayton Oliver's eyes. Yes, yes, I did yeah. see that. I never actually saw what he uh, him getting rubbed out. There you go. Yeah. I thought that was a bit rough. Oliver's on his throat. <laughs> well, then then Barry sort of got on top of him and gave him one of these in the eye, like a real yeah, sort yeah. of... Yeah, oh, he got on top of him. Okay, I saw yeah. a still where he's on the ground and he... Admittedly, yeah. you should never go for someone's eye. Yeah. But I think if somebody's on your throat, then you... Yeah. I think there's got to be a little bit of leeway. But if he rolls yeah. over, then yeah. He did it on top as well, I think. Yeah. He raked him. Yeah, gross. Um, <laughs> prediction, Geelong, 25 points. Yeah. Agreed Sounds about right. I'd about buy into that. Maybe yeah. even more. It's one of those things yeah. I could see Geelong just put them to the sword. Geelong have that firepower, don't yeah. they? Um, Cameron and Hawkins yeah. don't make mistakes often. It's either going to be like a goal or two or they're put to the sword, I mm. think. Yeah. So, so that averages out at your 25? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <That's it>. yeah. <laughs> uh, other prelims, Sydney versus Collingwood. Ooh, uh, that's the SCG. I think this is the first... Yeah. 
prelim at the SCG in something like 20 years or something because they played them at ANZ. We pl- uh, yeah, because I was going to say, I remember playing them in a prelim in Sydney. I don't know if it was SCG or... I'm pretty sure it was ANZ. I think it uh, goes days back to before that that they've played a um, SCG for, uh, prelim final, uh, uh, which is interesting. Um, pies were a little bit cleaner against the Dockers. I yep. have that note written down. We talked about that a little bit. I think um, it's a side that's a good blend of experience and young talent. Yep. Um, a lot of guys who have seen it all before, a lot of t- players in that team have played in the grand final. So their ability to cope with the situation, um, it's unlike other sort of young teams. They've come from 17th and they're in a prelim now. It's quite wild. Uh. Um, yeah, we, we kind of already talked about the, the final, but I'll say that Crisp was probably one of my favourite players on the field. Yep, we talked about ages for you guys, but in terms of Collingwood, two goals, 24 touches. Degoe was pretty influential. Yep. Ginevan was pretty good. Yeah, he kicked three goals. Um, yep. He's frustratingly had a good yeah. year. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, no, but yeah, they've got some firepower. And Jamie Elliott has been yep. really impactful this season um, and, and bobbing up at clutch moments as well. It's good to see him healthy. I've always been a fan of the way he's played, Jamie yeah. Elliott. He's a great player. Yeah, yep. 100%. I think, again, we're looking at a tall order here for the, for the Pies. Mm. Um, the last time they met, they came up against Sydney in the second last game of the year, I think, and uh, came up short, and the Swans were, from memory, um, according to my research, I didn't watch the game, but uh, sort of beat them in terms of both contested and uncontested ball yeah. tackles. They just had uh, a way of beating the Pies, and they're going to have to do it again at the SCG. So That's the thing with the Swans. Like Even in their first final against Melbourne, the thing that impressed me about them is they can play both sort of styles, mm, mm. and they're able to like stop a team's momentum really well and yeah. sort of ride the wave and then counter beautifully. Mm. You're right. They, they, they're quite... They've got some dour plays in there, like Row Bottom and Parker yeah. and stuff like that. But on the like transition, they are devastating sometimes. Sure. The, uh, they've slipped under the radar for me a little bit. And I'll admit, like mm. it's been a year where I went to Europe and probably wasn't watching as much footy closely and probably missed a lot of Sydney games. But I never really considered them a genuine contender until, well, I think, July. I think they're like undefeated since June or something. I, I could be wrong on that, but they're very close to being. Yeah, they've probably lost one or two in there maybe. But yeah, yeah on the whole, they've been pretty dominant. Yeah, and then... Um, Beating Melbourne, uh, admittedly, yeah. when Melbourne then lose to Brisbane, is start to devalue that win a little bit. But they beat Melbourne twice yeah. this year, and uh, generally have been strong against. Uh, it was the way they beat Melbourne in that final, though, because like Melbourne true. did start to get a bit of that momentum, but mm. they were able to stuff it every time, just yeah. stop them and yeah, take um, the punch and then counter punch beautifully. Mm. Yes, yeah, S- Sydney's well, they've beaten Geelong this year, beaten Melbourne this year. Mm. Um, and they have beaten Collingwood this year at the ground they're going to be playing them at, and I think ticks all the boxes in terms of what you want from a contender. So, yeah, long story short, uh, Sydney slipped under the radar for me this year. The top four finish actually kind of surprised me with the way I think other teams sort of faltered, and um, now they're in the box eight, and I think I think they're going to beat Collingwood. Oh, yeah. Who do you, th- who do you think I'd tip win? Sydney out of the two for yeah. sure. Yeah, it's a tough Especially one. Especially at the SAJ as well. Collingwood are well and truly good enough to win this game and win the grand final. I've just... I don't want to be wrong by underrating Sydney again as well. That's yeah. part of it. But I think they're going to have Collingwood's measure here. Yeah, I think they've just got the tools at their disposal to stop what yeah. Collingwood want to do often enough it does to almost have the ascendancy feel, when they do have momentum. It has felt at times this year Collingwood's had a bit of a cheat code on the season. <laughs> With their ability, well, they won six yeah. games in a row but under a goal. Um, and this, the way they just ruined Carlton's yeah. season in the final round is it's kind of yeah. funny in a sadistic way. Um so, any outcome is possible. I, I think this will be the closer of the two finals, mm. and it is harder to tip, but I am going to go with Sydney, and I'll say a thriller. I'll say five points. Yeah, I'll probably say Sydney 13, 15 points, something okay. like that. So, we're both picking a Geelong-Sydney grand final. Yep. If you could choose, what would be your preferred grand final matchup? Probably that. Yeah, Geelong yeah. and Sydney? Yeah, I the thought, older veteran team versus the young upcomers in Sydney. I would love to see a Sydney-Brisbane grand final. Personally, well, that'd be spicy. Yeah, this always uh, this is always something I think about. But I wonder what jumpers they would wear. Her. Because I think Sydney wear the. I don't think they wear the red shorts and normal jumper when they play Brisbane in full maroon. But yeah. but Brisbane couldn't wear the Fitzroy jumper. This is not relevant. I'm just yeah. sort of talking shit here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I th- I think my preference would actually be a Sydney Brisbane grand final. Purely because we haven't seen an interstate grand final, entirely interstate grand final since twenty, sorry, two thousand four. Uh, I think that's been a common year in this particular yeah. podcast. But uh, yeah, an interesting I statistic I saw from the first week of finals: no Melbourne team won in the first week of finals. No huh. Melbourne-based team. 
Yeah. Because Geelong beat yeah, okay. Collingwood. Yeah. Who's the third one? Brisbane, Fremantle, and Sydney. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that was an interesting little tidbit. Yeah. Who are you going for now? Do you have Sydney, a I guess. Going for the Swans? Yeah. yeah. I I don't really care who wins, actually. I, you know, it's, I was thinking this. I was uh, Somebody asked me who I'm going for, and I thought, Geelong's probably the team I want to see win the least because I feel like it'd be boring. Mm. But they haven't won a flag yeah, in 11 years. Thing, yeah. <laughs> They've won a flag less recently yeah. than Sydney. Yeah. Um, and Collingwood was around that mm. mark as well. But I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing Collingwood win, but I think I think it'd be Sydney or Brisbane of the two teams yeah. I'd, I'd like to see. Hence why I'd prefer them to play each other. Yeah, uh, I've just sort of hopped on Sydney because I like the way they go about it, I guess. Mm, but yeah. Brizzy, I probably wouldn't be opposed to ever. Like, mm. Lockie Neal would be good for True. to vindicate him, I guess. Even would, though that yeah. move annoyed me. But, it would legitimise yeah. their entire... Yeah. Team over the last three or four years, yeah, yeah. Uh, as you could say about any of these teams, including Geelong, who have mm. been around the mark and ultimately just couldn't quite um, finish off a you know a strong Richmond side, for instance. That was a tough yeah. tough period for to come up against Richmond. Oh yeah, cool. All right, we'll finish off with some uh, Brownlow talk. Um, Bush, yeah. are you up to date with um, or are you immersed in the Brownlow stuff? You like your betting? Sort of. I've. Because I did a bet very early in the year, Andy Brayshaw for the Brownlow, but he was paying like $15 when I put that bet on. That's all right. At one stage, I could have cashed it out for triple what I put down. At the moment, I can cash it for about double, so it's profit yeah. there. But at this How point, much did I'm, you put down, sorry? 30 bucks. 30 bucks. Yeah, yeah, okay. But at this point, I'm at sort of at the point where I'm just going to let it ride, I think. Yeah, I think it's close enough to... Let it ride, yeah. So, um, this is never uh, entirely reliable, but I, I looked at the AFL.com uh, Brownlow predictor. Just a bit of an idea, because yeah. obviously it's too hard to know if you just watch football who's going to win the Brownlow, yeah, yeah. right? So, you need some... That's obviously going to be based on some data. So, their top five, they have yeah. Took Miller winning it. Yep. Uh, I think one or two votes ahead of Brayshaw in yep. second. Oliver third, Cripps fourth, and Neil five. Sounds about right. I did put a cheeky tenner on Tuke Miller as well. Yeah, okay. Sorry, it was a cheeky 20 on Tuke Miller. Yeah, right. Because I sort of went, yeah, he was paying eight bucks. There was like guys like Christian Petrarca and mm. other dudes like that rated ahead of him. I'm like, mm. no, every time Gold Coast has done well, he's probably getting the three votes. Yeah. And they've done well enough this year. Yeah. It could be like a five in 19 type of Brownlow. Mm. I noticed that um, a couple of uh, interesting ones were Prestia 7th. He, he's mm. a great player, yep. uh, but he's paying like $150 to win the whole thing. So <laughs> I think that's bad. without looking at his top five um, odds, that'd be uh, worth yeah. having a punt. I think Callum Mills is a decent outside shot as well. He's a great yeah. player. Had a great season this year. Not, not to win the whole thing. monster games, yeah. Yeah, yeah if, if you got him in fantasy, you know oh, what yeah. we're talking about. Um, more like a top five smoky, I think, yeah, not yeah. to win it. I... I'd be happy for Brayshaw to win it, to be yeah, honest. I, I like him. I'd be quite happy with the 450 yeah. bucks and my Freo boy winning yeah. a Brownlow. I'd be yeah. quite happy with that. <laughs> I think I've predicted a Brownlow tie like every year because I'm like, ah, <laughs> oh, we're due one. Yeah. Um, so a Took and Brayshaw tie would be kind of cool. <sighs> wonder if I get the payout on both if that happens. Yeah. That'd be good. You should, I reckon. That'd be my dream scenario. Then. Yeah, imagine that. Get the payout on both. That's yeah, like fucking 700 they, bucks or something. They both get a medal. Yeah. Yeah, you'd be... Stitched, you'd be stitched up if you didn't get anything. They'd probably do you the half payment yeah, bullshit, probably, probably the yeah. slippery fuckers. Yeah, but it shouldn't huh. because unless it says outright winner, it might. If it says outright winner, that's different. Then you will get zero, <laughs> I reckon. But if it just says winner, that's. It different. just says AFL Brownlow twenty twenty two. I reckon. Yeah. I reckon you'd be right. sweet there if it's a tie. So yeah, six hundred bucks if that tie happens. <laughs> mate. Very nice. That's very juicy. That's a few beverages at Metro's. <laughs> <laughs> What's Metro's? <laughs> um, oh, Sean McManus kept bringing it up on this podcast the other day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it makes you realise how old Metro's is uh, and how old we are as well. He was telling a story like back when he was pre-selected by Freo, but like you can't, his dad had an argument with the Freo coach. So then oh, really? Carlton had heard about it, so they sent like this forty-five-year-old assistant coach over who was buying him drinks at Metro's Freo, trying really? to get him to come to Carlton. <laughs> Metro's. <laughs> oh god. Yeah, I got laugh a, at it. It was probably a Greek restaurant back then, El Metropolis. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, just a few points about um, uh, some value bets. I, I was looking at Brayshaw. They reckon, according to this, um, polls sixteen votes from the first eight games, but yeah. isn't the leader after ten rounds. It's Oliver. So you're looking mm. at Brayshaw yeah. after five rounds, Oliver after ten. I'd imagine the odds will reflect. I that bet as well. Cripps round five leaders paying like a dollar one or something. Otherwise, yeah, that'd be right. a good shout. Yeah, I don't know. I think I, I think according to this, it was Brayshaw. But Brayshaw was the round five leader. 
I think so. If I, anyone other than Patrick tab. Cripps is the round later after round five, bet on Patrick Cripps. Okay, all right. That's Good all tab. I have to say. All right. I didn't look at it, uh, Cripps that closely. I think I, I closed <laughs> He went the nuts at the start of the year. Yeah, yeah. He did, didn't he? And yeah. that was when, you know, it was um, Flagton. Yeah. Was the hashtag. <laughs> 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 flag blues. I think that's what it actually yeah. was. Yeah. Blue flags. Yeah. Somebody was asking me what where the hell flag mantle came from. And I said, well, it's actually been a thing for a number of years. Like flag pies was a thing. Yeah. Um, flag D's Flag and, D's nuts Yeah, flag D's nuts <laughs> um, As important um, Flag mond <laughs> I think even flaggles got to run for it there oh, flaggles <laughs> yeah. Flaggles West Coast flaggles On your flaggles But it's never taken storm on social media quite like flag mantle Yeah It's interesting, I don't know why It's because it's going to be our first yeah. We're going to pop the cherry I mean, you were nowhere near it <laughs> Respectfully, like you Round nine, six. we were around it yeah, okay. When it first maybe, popped up. Yeah, maybe, yeah. When you but it's one of those things that died in the arse, came back a little. Yeah. Flag Monday, it turned into once Monday announced his retirement. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, so that's completely irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. Well, we were undefeated until last night since Monday announced his retirement. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, right. That's funny. My conspiracy fear is, is he only retired to get the boys to pull their fingers out and start playing like mm. they did at the start of the year. Yeah, yeah. Well... That wraps up the podcast, I think, Bush. Yep. Um, it has been a pleasure to be back with you Bloody in here in the stewed. Oh, yeah. um, I'm a little bit hungover. I'm not going <laughs> to so I'm going to go home and edit this and nap, I think. Nice. Uh, so, it's, uh, I'm tired. It's been, it's been a long time since we've done a pod. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll... Um, can't do any streams. I can't even stream the Brownlow this week because I because they changed the day. Yeah. I am now at work um, during the Brownlow, which sucks. Big oof. That sucks. Like, yeah. Yeah, literally till like seven thirty our time. So maybe I'll catch the end of it. But yeah, uh, yeah anyway, guys, you can we're see gonna... that Tuke Miller Brayshaw, yeah, yeah, arm in arm on stage while I'm celebrating. Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, it sucks that I'm gonna miss it. It's really hitting me now. Um, it's fun, it's a fun night at the Brownlow. Oh yeah. But yeah, so I'm just trying to organise my thoughts. What are we gonna do? We're not gonna do any streams this weekend, unfortunately. Uh, would you be up for a grand final stream again? Possibly, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you got plans. Like, I haven't really thought too much about yeah. it, but I don't really know what else I would do for grand final day. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll probably do it. Um, won't get a prelim stream in, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, so you always get in a prelim stream before the podcast. <laughs> oh, I do. Yeah, yeah. He's talking about the fact that I pee every time we do a podcast. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Anyway, guys, thank you for tuning in. If you're watching this on YouTube, it's also on Spotify. If you're listening to this on Spotify, it's also on YouTube. Click the so. icon that looks like this, people. Yes, the like button, the subscribe button. Um, check out manscaped.com for male grooming needs. I desperately need a manscape. I haven't touched it since Europe. Touched it? I wish I hadn't said that. Anyway, thank you guys, and we'll see you in the next one.